Boldwood presents Family Secrets at the Ingle Nook Inn Written by Helen Rolfe And read by Stephanie Cannon and Thomas Judd The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. Chapter 1 Rupert The Ingle Nook Inn, an elegant brownstone in the heart of Greenwich Village, New York City, had been Rupert's workplace for the last few years. Whereas some people worked hard for the financial reward, and largely because they had to, Rupert couldn't deny that his job as the chef at the inn was a sheer pleasure. Even getting up at an early hour and starting his working day long before most people would didn't bother him. A little before 6 a.m., Rupert had already done most of the breakfast prep, and without any guests demanding his attention just yet, he headed out of the inn, down the steps out front, and after waiting for a taxi to pass, crossed to the next block and his favorite coffee shop. The sidewalks weren't too crowded yet, but they soon would be, with people out and about, either for work or leisure, and probably, much like him, savoring the almost non-existent humidity. A rare occurrence, at least by New York standards, in the warmer months. Rupert loved the seasonal shifts. He could never live anywhere like Florida, with its constant summer. Growing up in Vermont had meant having all the seasons, just as he experienced in New York. He liked the changes, whether subtle or as big as they could come. He loved that winter brought crisp frosts, heavy dumps of snow, and an icy landscape. And on days like today, he loved that spring brought with it a flourish. After months of sweater weather and being stuck indoors, the Manhattan streets were beginning to fill again. Cherry blossom bloomed, and the leaves on the trees reappeared as though they'd always been there, and fall had never happened. At the coffee shop, Rupert grabbed himself and his boss, Sophia, a coffee. She'd been at her desk, situated in the communal lounge of the inn, almost as long as he'd been in the kitchen. These days, the Inglenook Inn never had much of a lull in bookings, so it was simply a case of being busy or busier. Once he'd got the coffees, Rupert headed back to the inn and took the steps two at a time to the entryway at the top of the hall stoop flanked with wrought iron railings. Enormous planters filled with delicate violet blooms mixed with mustard yellows and deep verdant green foliage framed the dark double doors. It's perfect weather, Sophia he announced, letting the front door close behind him as he expertly balanced one takeout cup on top of another. The longer he worked here, the more informal they got, and Sophia felt more like a friend or even family than a boss. It's fresh this early on, but the sun is out. It's going to be a great day. Here's hoping, she called over from the desk at the far end of the lounge. Rupert swore they had a similar conversation most mornings, and it had come to be a part of his day. He handed her one of the coffees. One oat milk latte for you? My savior. She briefly looked up from the computer screen. This was where she usually started her day, checking any new bookings, responding to guest queries, and managing the various tasks when it came to running a boutique hotel. He occasionally stepped in to help out, but mostly this was her domain. The kitchen was his. You know where I'll be, Rupert said brightly as he set off from the lounge, along the hallway, past the staircase, and all the way to the back of the brownstone. He briefly glanced into the dining room that was adjacent to the kitchen to make sure it was all set up for breakfast. He'd done it himself last night, but it didn't hurt to double-check everything was as it should be. Breakfast service started at 6.30 a.m. and was flexible, but today he had a family of five who were checking out in a couple of hours. Usually breakfast worked as menu service, and guests could make their mind up at the last minute, 
But given the time pressure, the Tompkins family had not only elected to reserve the biggest table in the dining room, they'd already put orders in for a full cooked breakfast each. Rupert opened the window in the kitchen. Soon they'd be able to open the balcony doors in the dining room for guests to enjoy the spring breeze, but it wasn't quite warm enough yet. A few more days, or perhaps a week, he thought to himself, as he had another mouthful of coffee. When he heard the telltale sign of voices in the dining room, he had a sneaky look through the hatch. A little feature at the inn he hoped would never disappear, and knew it was almost time to start cooking. He didn't like to do so until guests were seated, nothing worse than reheated eggs. He checked his list again. The family was split in their choices. Two wanted eggs sunny side up. Three wanted their eggs poached. They all wanted toast and hash browns, and nobody was sure whether they'd have pancakes or not. Rupert had made the batter and put it in the refrigerator anyway because someone always wanted pancakes. In the dining room, he took orders for morning coffees, tea, herbal or traditional, and juices, and then, with that sorted, lost himself in the task as he cooked in his kitchen. Cooking was his therapy, and he was soon whistling as he popped sliced bread into the toaster, flipped eggs, cracked other eggs into boiling water, and served everything up in the professional manner people associated with the meals at the Inglenook Inn. The Tompkins family were content with their breakfast feast, and so it was on to some clearing up in the kitchen before anyone else showed up. Every now and then, he could check for other guests by peeking through the hatch, and he chuckled to himself, wondering what he would do if it wasn't there. Would Sophia have installed one to make things easy, or would he have to continually dash out of the kitchen and into the dining room to see who had appeared, who had left, who needed something else? Guests could, although rarely did, open the hatch themselves to make requests. Usually it was kids who opened it, wanting to watch Rupert in action. He didn't mind, but he was grateful he had the ability to lock it on one side, as he'd had to do when the terrible twins came to stay. They weren't terrible, really. Just inquisitive little boys. But when they started pushing toys through to the other side, he'd had to spoil their fun. He often lined food up along the counter near the hatch, and he had visions of a piece of Lego landing in a fruit cobbler and some unsuspecting guest discovering it. A quick peek through the hatch, and Rupert knew he had more guests to see to. He began the customary routine of dashing from kitchen to dining room and back again, whipping up breakfasts and serving with a smile. He didn't have any room service requests this morning, so at least he wouldn't be running up and down the three flights of stairs in the brownstone. They were a challenge, but they kept him fit, especially when he delivered food to the top floor. The entire top floor of the brownstone was home to the most palatial apartment of all, and it had gone from being rarely rented out to getting a constant influx of corporate clients. Furnished with vintage brown Chesterfield sofas in the lounge area, it had pocket doors to pull out to create an extra bedroom if required, plus an ornate fireplace with a beautiful mantle, above which was a giant mirror. The apartment had a luxury bathroom with a roll-top tub and a master bedroom with a deluxe super king bed, as well as a chaise long at one edge of the room that had a view across the rooftops of Manhattan. The rest of the apartments in the Inglenook Inn were spread between the first and second floors. Back in the kitchen, with a lull as the last couple of guests vacated the dining room, he went through the current list of everyone staying at the inn to check he had indeed provided breakfast for every guest apart from the couple in apartment four. They'd chatted with him yesterday afternoon at the small bar area in the lounge, and on their request, he'd filled the refrigerator in their apartment so they could fix their own breakfast and set off bright and early this morning for their trip to the Hamptons. Rupert finished clearing the kitchen as Sophia came in. Six guests have confirmed they'd like an evening meal tonight. 
she told him. Sure thing, boss, he winked. They'd always had an easy rapport. Some guests mistook them for a mother and son team, and he hadn't minded at all. Neither had his mom, Verity, when he told her. In fact, she'd come to visit last year and really hit it off with Sophia, telling her as though Rupert were thirteen, not thirty-three, that she was glad Rupert worked somewhere that felt so much like a home. Both women had sat in the lounge, and over several large glasses of wine, they'd put the world, or at least the hotel sector, to rights, saying how big hotels could very easily become impersonal and weren't a true slice of New York. Not like the Inglenook Inn. Rupert smiled to himself. He always felt like this was a slice of true New York, working in a brownstone, a classic environment of the city, if ever there was one. He watched Sophia now as she glanced in the refrigerator, one hand on her tummy. You're hungry. He was pretty astute when it came to women, or at least he liked to think he was. With a mom and four sisters, he figured that gave him a reasonable amount of insight. French toast? Pancakes? She smiled. If it's not too much trouble. Of course it isn't. Sit yourself down. She settled herself onto the high stool as he made the egg mixture. It's nice to take a breather for a few minutes. But her breather and their chat was short-lived when someone rang the stainless steel call bell at the front desk, which was surprisingly loud. Sophia disappeared and came back a minute or so later to tell him another guest would require the evening meal. At the Inglenook Inn, breakfast was provided to all guests, but with this being New York, where there was a plethora of wonderful restaurants, many chose to have their evening meal elsewhere. Sophia did her best to remain flexible, but as a relatively small establishment with varying clientele, they tended to ask guests to confirm around breakfast time whether they wanted dinner. It meant Rupert could ensure the freshest of ingredients, stocking up on produce from familiar vendors at Chelsea Market and the meatpacking district as required, either late at night or in the morning, depending on the inn's demands. He'd gone into the habit of buying a little more than he really needed to so they could cater for last-minute bookings. It also meant that quite often he had enough for extra portions to provide Sophia and himself an evening meal. Remind me what's on the menu tonight? Sophia prompted as he lifted the pieces of bread from the egg mixture into the hot skillet. Rupert reeled off the two main courses guests could choose from. He was making a spring vegetable lasagna using fresh silky pasta he'd make this afternoon, vegetables he'd selected from the markets late last night, and a couple of firm cheeses he'd sourced, one a particular favorite for this dish with its infusion of black truffle and one that would create the perfect gooey texture for the menu option. He was also making steak with onion relish and potatoes served in a choice of two ways. Which one are you hoping is left over? He asked as he set the plate of golden brown French toast in front of her and prompted her to wait while he grabbed the maple syrup. His mom had brought a big bottle all the way from Vermont as a present for the inn's owner when she visited last year, and their supply hadn't run out yet. Rupert had decanted it into several smaller bottles to make the pouring easier. Sophia drizzled the syrup over her French toast. Do you really have to ask? The lasagna, he concluded, adding, It's the cheese. He carried on washing the last of the pans. I'll head out again later and pick up the seafood for tomorrow. I'm thinking swordfish or lemon sole, not sure yet. You're a true gift to this kitchen. She lifted her fork to direct the comment in his direction, even though there was no doubt who it was for. When she was done with breakfast, Sophia rinsed her plate and slotted it into the almost full dishwasher. I'd better get on with housekeeping and check which apartments need supplies replenished. 
Each apartment, for guests' convenience, had a kitchenette with all the necessities. A coffee machine, a kettle, a small refrigerator, a cupboard with basic provisions. At the inn, they also prided themselves on providing complimentary additions like a basket of fresh fruit or packets of cookies, and usually during a guest's stay, they got to know preferences. There was little point adding to a fruit basket that went untouched, yet the cupboard was cleared of cookies, and vice versa. Just give me a list, Rupert said before he caught her eye. Are you positive you don't mind me being under your feet? The Inglenook Inn had six separate apartments in total, one of which was Sophia's. Rupert had been staying at the inn while his own place had necessary repairs, but a guest had called yesterday wanting a last-minute booking. As one of the strengths of Sophia's business was that she was adaptable, prepared to go the extra mile to accommodate sudden requests, he'd moved into Sophia's spare room to free up the smallest apartment. Don't be daft, of course I don't, she said with a smile as she left him to it. Rupert dried one of the pans he'd washed by hand. It was hard to think that Sophia had ever considered selling her beloved inn, but she had. She sometimes referred to that time as her moment of madness, and he for one was glad she hadn't gone through with it, not only because he loved his job, but because this place and Sophia just fit somehow. He wasn't sure whether one would ever be right without the other. Sophia nipped into the kitchen during housekeeping time to remind Rupert that he had to make a packed lunch for the woman in apartment one today. Once he'd seen to that, he cleaned the kitchen surfaces until they were gleaming and ready for round two, which was either snacks made to order throughout the day or it would be the dinner tonight. Rupert took his break in the lounge and settled on the sofa to enjoy a long glass of freshly squeezed orange juice and a slice of coffee cake. He closed his eyes briefly, savoring the rest, but the respite didn't last long because Sophia came back into the room and he knew straight away that something was up. What's wrong? She looked so distraught, he put down his glass and went over to her. What's happened? I just had a call. Her voice wobbled, and she was shaking as it all came tumbling out. Gabriella, her daughter, had been in an accident. Gabriella's husband had called Sophia from their home in Switzerland to let Sophia know that Gabriella was in hospital, but he didn't seem to know whether her condition was stable yet. What can I do? Rupert's voice was firm when she looked like she was going to crumble. I need to get to her. Of course you do. I need to go, Rupert. I know. So let's get you organized. But... He knew her thoughts went to this place, her business, her livelihood. I've got it all in hand. He didn't. He'd never had to manage the place on his own before. Sure, he'd done it for a day or two here and there, and it was exhausting. But more than that, never. He went over to the computer and pulled up an extra chair for her to slump into. First of all, let's get you a flight. With the beauty of technology, Sophia's flight was organized and booked for a few hours' time. Go and pack your things. But, Rupert, this place, I'll have to close. And send everyone home? He smiled at her, more confident than he felt. No chance. I'll make some calls, get some help. Your priority is your daughter. She didn't need telling twice. She went to her apartment to pack her things because he knew full well that if it was a choice between the inn and Gabriella she'd let this place go to ruin. It was what you did, wasn't it, when a family member needed you. Regardless of the consequences, you dropped everything. But Rupert wasn't about to let the Inglenook Inn crumble in her absence, nor was he going to cancel anyone's bookings. He stood up tall from the desk, hands interlinked behind his head, 
rubbing his palms up and down the back of his head as he puffed out his cheeks. How the hell was he supposed to do this? He might have said he could manage, he'd be fine, but already he wasn't so sure. There was only one person who could help him now. He took out his phone, found the number in his contacts, and made the call. Darcy, it's Rupert. I need you. I mean, really need you. Call me. He only hoped she would. And soon. Chapter 2 Katie Katie released her wavy blonde hair from its low ponytail, the ponytail she only just managed to fashion, given it wasn't really quite long enough to tie back. But her job required smart dress at all times, and hair was to be pinned up if it was long, which hers apparently qualified as. As Katie trudged down the street well away from work, she tugged the discreet clips from her hair that she'd used to keep the stray wisps under control. It didn't matter what her boss thought of her now, did it? Because, after a few weeks working her notice, she'd just finished her job as the front desk clerk at a large hotel in Manhattan. Along with a dozen others working various jobs for the hotel chain, she was a victim of what was commonly known as a restructure, code for job losses, in Katie's opinion. Being out of a job wasn't great, but right now, Katie felt free, finally out from under the cloud she'd been working beneath ever since she'd been handed the news in a formal letter. Morale was low amongst staff. Even those who still had a job feared it wouldn't be long before the rug was pulled out from under them, too. And some had reacted badly by phoning in sick or simply not turning up. Katie was one of the few who'd stuck it out. She made her way to her favorite bagel shop, in need of some comfort food. She'd been on the early shift today, so she was finished by lunchtime and she was famished. Handily, this place was on the way home. Home? What even was that nowadays? An apartment with her dad when she was 29 years old. Not the family home she'd grown up in, but a residence he and she had both escaped to when they desperately needed change. And now, her dad had a long-term girlfriend, which meant everything was changing again. The waitress smiled warmly as Katie placed an order for a bagel with breaded chicken, tomato sauce, and melted cheese. Good to see you, Katie. She came in here often, and when she did, either ordered this or the smoked salmon with cream cheese and capers. You worked the early shift today? The woman added as she heaped on a generous amount of fillings to the wonderfully fresh bagel. Yeah, for my sins, Katie joked. She wasn't about to tell her it would be the last early shift for a while, unless she found more work soon. Great flavors, fantastic service with a smile, and the best bagels ever, thought Katie as she sat down. But before she unwrapped the lunchtime delight, she checked her emails again. She'd put out feelers about jobs weeks ago, but hadn't had even a whiff of interest yet, and she was starting to worry. She groaned, still nothing lurking in her inbox. And so she tried to focus on the good food in front of her right now, rather than the fact she was jobless. Katie hadn't been out of work for years. She'd gone from a retail assistant to a kitchen hand, worked behind a bar, waitressed in more than one cafe, and upgraded to a restaurant before she moved to hotel work, where she'd held various positions in housekeeping. She'd worked for different employers in the suburbs and in Manhattan, and it was to those she'd mainly sent her resume in the hope that her past record might help, but so far nothing. When she was halfway through her bagel and her tummy was no longer grumbling at the lack of food, she took out her phone again to scroll through social media. She saw her now ex-colleague Jane had already scored a job as a waitress at a top-end restaurant. Shannon, who had been on the housekeeping team, had shared a picture of her and her boyfriend in Brooklyn, along with a caption which read, It's going to be a lazy summer. And Paul, who had worked as a concierge, had posted a photo of airline tickets. 
He'd talked about returning to England and his family, and he was finally doing it. She left a comment against Paul's post with an emoji of the British flag and her well wishes. The next post she scrolled to was a sponsored ad for a stunning venue called the Corbridge Hotel out in Inglenook Falls, Connecticut. It looked beautiful, complete with amazing views and a spa. Of course, it was advertising for guests rather than workers, but perhaps it was something to think about, going further out of the city. She was about to click on the ad and see if there were any links to human resources when another ad caught her eye beneath it, this time for a smaller establishment in the same locale. The Inglenook Lodge in Inglenook Falls wanted waiting staff for a two-week period to cover a wedding celebration, and Katie knew she was perfectly capable with her experience. It wasn't long-term, but it didn't matter. Something was better than nothing. Katie didn't hesitate to call the number on the advert to speak with the woman who ran the place, someone called Darcy. She didn't get to speak to Darcy directly, but she did leave a voicemail, and despite it being garbled, having not planned what she needed to say in her desperation to show an interest in getting quickly, at least it was done. Perhaps later on this evening she'd have to start extending her search, and accept that a commute was very much on the cards, unless something came up close by. As she enjoyed the last part of her bagel before she really got back to reality and went home, Katie people watched, eyes widening at the man who had fish flip-flops on his feet and wondering where he'd found those. She watched two elderly men chatting by the window, one of them laughing so much he was wiping tears from his eyes. She loved the busyness of it in here, and already felt the pressure of too much time hanging around the apartment if she didn't have a job to go to. She drank a large Coke, the fizz making her burp discreetly, and giggled at the thought of doing that at the front desk. That wouldn't have gone down well at all. Some workers had altered their behavior and their annoyance at being laid off, but Katie was smarter than that. It was hardly a decision made by the people on the ground, as it were, and besides, she needed the money she'd earn until her last day, and she definitely needed the reference. There'd be no burning of bridges, otherwise she'd never be able to get her own place. It was high time, and had her mom not died five years ago, it might have happened sooner. But Katie had stayed with her dad after her mom passed, and they'd become a close-knit team, the pair of them. At least they had been, until her dad, Wade, found Stephanie. These days, Katie felt more like a spare part, because even though Stephanie had her own apartment, she was usually at theirs. And home wasn't quite as spacious as it once had been. They'd swapped a grand Tudor-style house with old-world charm, nine-foot ceilings and custom moldings at the end of a leafy street in Scarsdale, for a two-bedroom, two-bathroom condo with oversized windows, a 24-hour doorman, and a live-in super on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. Katie hadn't hesitated to make the move with her dad either, because with her mom gone, the old house had no longer felt like home. Moving had been an adventure, a change that finally allowed them to feel a shift in their melancholy to a happier state. An apartment in the city was well away from the constant reminders that her mom, Judy, would never again call up the stairs to say dinner was ready. She would never be reading a book on the porch swing late into the evening, only giving up when the natural light did. She'd never again wrap her arms around Wade in the kitchen the second he got home from work, as though she couldn't bear to be apart from him for too long. All of those things were memories, sewn into Katie's heart, into Wade's too, and the move to the city was a fresh start for both of them. They said when you lost someone you loved, there was a before and an after, and they were right. Katie's life, as well as her dad's, had a very clear dividing line. And now, Katie saw another change giving them a before Stephanie and an after Stephanie. Before Stephanie, Katie and her dad had watched movies together with big bowls of popcorn, a lot of which had been found the next day down the side of the couch. It had been watching the Super Bowl together and yelling at the screen when it didn't go the way they wanted. 
before Stephanie, had been lazy breakfasts together on the days Katie's shifts allowed. They'd go to a cafe they'd never been to and try out the house special. Big holidays had involved heading out into the city to explore something new. One Easter, they'd ended up laughing away at the acoustic oddity of the Grand Central Terminal Whispering Gallery. One Christmas, they'd discovered the Garland Street Markets and had both known Judy would have spent a fortune there, especially at the knitting stall. Last Fourth of July weekend, they'd taken a picnic over to Brooklyn Bridge Park where they'd stayed to watch the Manhattan skyline and the Brooklyn Bridge become a magnificent backdrop for fireworks. Then came the after Stephanie, when things changed rapidly. Movie nights were for three, not two. Stephanie wasn't into sports, but had arranged for all three of them to watch the Super Bowl at a restaurant. Katie's dad explored the city with Stephanie, who knew all the hidden places, having lived here for many years, and holidays were now shared. Katie had almost been able to imagine her mom frowning and telling her to give Stephanie a chance, to appreciate that she really was only trying to do the right thing. But life had been Katie and her dad for so long, with all the baggage the family had in their wake, and Katie found it hard to admit she was struggling with the shift. Part of that was because she knew she was being unreasonable, Her dad deserved to choose who he spent time with. He should be happy. But her protective guard had gone up the moment Stephanie came on the scene. She hadn't expected the union to last, if she was entirely honest. She thought they'd have a bit of fun, and they, or rather Stephanie, would get bored. Wade was almost ten years older than her, and Katie had thought they wouldn't have much in common at all. But they never seemed short of things to say. They laughed together and they both regularly went to the driving range at Chelsea Piers. Although so far, Wade hadn't persuaded Stephanie to accompany him for a proper game of golf at the country club he'd been a member at for years. Katie hoped that whatever the future held for Wade and Stephanie, nothing would come between her and her dad. She'd lost enough family as it was. When Katie arrived back at the apartment, Stephanie must have heard the door and came out of the kitchen, into the narrow hallway of the two-bed condo that was fine for dad and daughter, but these days felt cramped. Hey, Katie. Katie switched on a smile and tried to talk herself round to being more open and conversational. Hey. She dropped her house key into the bowl on the table and hung her bag on a hook against the wall. How was work? Wade said it was your last day? Katie bristled as she kicked off her shoes. Busy she answered. She told her dad when she got given her notice, but she'd avoided talking about it ever since. This was the first time Stephanie had mentioned that she knew, and Katie supposed she should feel grateful she hadn't been grilled before now. If Judy was still alive, Katie would have probably talked to her mom about it every single day. She had a knack for conversation, they both did, and their lengthy talks were one of the things Katie missed the most. They could go on for hours, batting around ideas, moaning about big things, but also the little niggles in life if they felt they needed to. They'd talk about everything and nothing at the same time. Wade had found it fascinating they could go on for so long. Nowadays, he did a good job with talking, but he had always been quieter than Judy. He was the one who disappeared into his thoughts the most, happy in his own company. Katie's bond with her dad lay in other things, like watching the game or getting excited to try a new restaurant or coffee shop that had opened up. Or at least it had before Stephanie. You've got something on your shirt. Stephanie stepped closer and pointed a nude painted nail toward something in a slightly darker shade on Katie's cream top. Stephanie was a savvy dresser. She wasn't skinny. She wasn't a big woman either but she wore things that flattered her curves and showed off slender legs. And rather than disguise her grays, the color of her mid-length hair was a faded caramel with streaks of gray allowed to show through in such a way that it looked incredibly natural. Katie plucked it off. Bagel. And she added, thanks. Was it good? 
A piece of bagel definitely wouldn't look good on Stephanie's sky-blue light-weave top. Usually, Katie would harumph and head for her room, but she was an adult. She knew she should try to be mature about her dad's relationship. Very good. Lashings of melted cheese, breaded chicken? You're making me hungry. Haven't had any lunch yet. I'm about to have a milkshake, though. Would you like one? It's strawberry. She followed her into the kitchen. This was what made Katie feel worse. She might think that Stephanie was all wrong for her dad, but she couldn't truly point out many reasons why. No, thanks. Too much with the bagel, but I appreciate the offer. Stephanie whizzed the blender and eyed Katie as though confused as to why she was hanging around and not leaving the room as soon as she could. So Katie took out a glass, adding lemon slices from the fridge and ice from the dispenser before filling it with water. She stood beside the floor-to-ceiling window that had a view of the street, a view she couldn't imagine ever growing tired of. If you stood in the center and looked between the buildings opposite, you caught a glimpse of green, a little sliver of the magnificent central park that lay beyond. Dad not in? Katie asked when the blender came to the end of its task. He'll be back soon, he's out for a run. I'll have one of these ready for him to enjoy after a shower. She poured the mixture into the two waiting glasses and slotted them both into the fridge. You're not drinking it? I'll wait for Wade. Katie frowned as a thought came to her. I didn't think Dad liked milkshakes. He always said milk should taste like milk. That was until he tried one of these. Oh. She zoned out as Stephanie began talking about the fruit she'd added, the scoop of some funny powder that had special properties and did something or other. Katie's dad had only dated one other woman since his wife died, a woman he'd gone on a blind date with after a well-meaning friend set them up. That woman had left him wondering what the point of dating even was. He'd never looked happy after they'd been out, and after the fourth time, he'd called it quits. Katie had been beyond relieved. They'd even managed to laugh about it. Perhaps it was time to trust her dad's judgment and maybe notice the little gestures Stephanie did that proved she wasn't out to hurt Wade. He'd lost the love of his life, the woman he thought he'd grow old with, and Katie had no idea what it must feel like for him. All she wanted was for him to be happy. I'm going to get changed. Katie said when Stephanie had hovered beside her, taking in the view long enough for it to feel a little uncomfortable being so close to one another. I might head to Central Park for a walk around. It was one thing losing her job, but quite another to be confined in the apartment all day. Good idea. The April showers appeared to have passed. We've already had some glorious May days. Katie managed to smile in Stephanie's direction before she headed to her bedroom to change. But rather than going straight into the ensuite to freshen up, she flopped down on her bed on her tummy, her head turning to focus on the picture of her mom in the silver-plated frame on her nightstand. The photo showed her mom some twenty or more years ago, pushing Katie on a swing in the park, her smile as big as her daughter's. And every time Katie looked at it, she could hear the laughter, her own giggles, the warmth of her mother's presence and bond. I wish you were here to talk to, Mom. She kept her gaze on the photograph as her fingers toyed with the intricately set pearl of the rose gold necklace her mom had given her for her 18th birthday. She leaned over, pulled out the bottom drawer of her nightstand, and took out the pink suede photograph album her mom had made and given to her alongside the necklace on her 18th. The pages of the hardback album contained the story of her life from the day she was born and she flipped through the special memories. I don't know what I'll do next, Katie said out loud to the photograph of her at age nine, holding her mom's hand, as dressed in a bumblebee costume, she went door to door trick-or-treating. You'd know what to say to me, wouldn't you, Mom? She smiled. I bet you'd make my favorite cookies, for comfort purposes, of course. She was speaking quietly, knowing she'd sound mad if Stephanie overheard. But she did this often, and it helped. She missed her mom, 
the pain and ache that no medicine could ever get rid of. It had been five years, and she'd give anything for just one more day with her. Twenty-four simple hours to be together. Before her mom got sick, Katie had been working in Manhattan for a couple of years, doing the commute between the city and Scarsdale. She'd soon started dating Sean after meeting him at a bar at Rockefeller Center. They already knew each other from years before, but had never been romantically involved until that day. And then, everything seemed to go wrong at once. Katie and Sean had talked about moving in together, but had realized they were better suited as friends. It sounded like an easy breakup, but it had still been an adjustment, and Katie had just got her head around that when her mom found out she was sick. One minute, Judy had been in great health. The next, she wasn't. Or at least that was the way it had felt. And Katie's world had slowly begun to crumble. What had started off as a small mole on Judy's scalp and seemed so inconsequential that nobody even went with her to the dermatologist to get it checked out had turned into the start of something big. Judy was diagnosed with melanoma, stage four, and it had already spread, invading her body and her organs, taking her from them less than a year after diagnosis. During the time her mom was sick, Wade had to keep working, the medical bills were piling up, and the only thing that would cover them was his high-paying job. Katie had eventually taken a leave of absence and become the one who spent the most time with Judy, apart from health visitors. And she'd known then, and still knew now, that she wouldn't have changed it for the world. Sean had carried on their friendship, he knew their family well, and even though they were broken up, Katie couldn't imagine having got through it all without him. He'd stop by to cook dinners or bring takeout. He'd been there to talk to and for Judy to chat with when Katie simply needed a break. And he'd helped Katie make her mom's final days as stress-free as they could be under the circumstances. He'd taken her dad out for the occasional beer to support him when Judy begged someone to get Wade away from the house because he was moping around as though the world was ending. Katie had tried to point out that his world was ending without her in it. But she hadn't needed to. Her mom knew it already. Katie puffed out her cheeks, put the photograph album back into the drawer, and closed it as she brought herself back to the present, back to reality. Katie had joined the workforce the moment she finished college, and now she felt like an epic failure for having no job to go to, and absolutely zip on the horizon. In her early twenties, not having a job for a time wouldn't have stressed her out. She'd have been fully confident about finding something else. But given all her inquiries this time had come to nothing, she was beginning to doubt how easy this would be. She freshened up in the ensuite before grabbing a casual top from its hanger and pairing it with denim pants. She pulled on her white sneakers and took a lightweight cardigan from the wardrobe. She'd only just opened her bedroom door when she heard voices and realized her dad was home. She was about to go say hello when she zoned in on the conversation not meant for her ears. You said you talked to her, Wade. It was Stephanie's voice. I will. I promise I'm just putting it off, Wade replied. And it went so quiet Katie sensed they were having a moment. Katie made a bit of unnecessary noise closing her bedroom door to announce she was around. She didn't want to go in mid-conversation. And once she was in the kitchen, smiled at her dad as though she hadn't heard any part of their talk, even though she wondered what her dad was putting off. She had a sinking feeling that he was going to ask her to move out. That couldn't be it, could it? She knew it was time but he'd never rushed her before. Not before Stephanie, anyway. Her dad was drinking the milkshake Stephanie had been making him earlier, and she was enjoying hers at the same time. I thought you only liked plain milk, Katie pointed out as soon as she joined them. But Wedge shrugged after another glug of the thickened liquid. Turns out I like milkshakes. Who knew? And he planted a kiss on Stephanie's cheek, as though she'd been the one to invent the concept. 
How was the run? Katie registered the sweaty t-shirt and shorts and tried to keep the conversation light. She was determined not to let it show that anything was bothering her. Best time yet. He had muscular legs, never seemed to put on much weight around his middle, and even though his once thick hair had thinned on top, it suited him. Not bad for someone who didn't take up running until recently. And that was another thing. It wasn't only milkshakes Wade had been introduced to. He'd never run before, at least not since his college days. He was a golfer and a walker, and that was the extent of it, before Stephanie. Are you sure you don't need the go-ahead from the doctor? Katie frowned. Shouldn't you get a clean bill of health before introducing something as strenuous as running? I'm still standing, aren't I? I don't know, Katie. You worry too much about me. I'd hug you and tell you I was perfectly okay if I wasn't so sweaty. I think I'll pass. She tried to make light of it, but she'd meant what she said. Was running really a good idea when he hadn't pushed himself that much in years? And now she had to ignore her dad messing about as he pretended he was going to hug Stephanie, and she did that girlish giggle that said, don't come near me, but really meant she was enjoying the flirting. Her dad turned his attentions back to Katie and noted the bag she had with her. Are you going out somewhere? Walking, she said. Central Park. Well, it's a beautiful day, Wade concluded, as Stephanie refused his help and pulled over a step stool so she could climb onto it and put the blender jug away in one of the uppermost cabinets. Winter is over. Now he'd set down his empty glass, he put up his arms as though he were part of the spectator crowd at a sports event. Oh, Wade, winter has its benefits. Stephanie took his outstretched hand as she climbed down once again and put the step stool away between two of the cupboards. Cold weather is cozy. We can take romantic walks in the snow, go away to a cabin for the weekend and build a campfire. Katie didn't want to think about her dad and his girlfriend having a romantic interlude anywhere, whether revoltingly sweaty in the heat or at a winter temperature so cold that it could turn your breath into mist every time you spoke. Wade took his sunglasses from the top of his head where they were still nestled, having only just come back, and he put them on. Give me sunshine any day. He began to make a joke about making Stephanie go to Florida all winter, and Stephanie batted back that she'd prefer ski lodges and hot cider. Katie filled her water bottle at the sink, and as she turned around, she didn't miss the look her dad exchanged with Stephanie after he'd put his glasses back on top of his head. It was clear the exchange between the pair had to do with the part of the discussion Katie had overheard moments ago, and whatever it was that Wade was putting off telling her. All right, you two she said in a tone that sounded like roles had been reversed, with them the miners and her in charge. What's going on? Stephanie said nothing but looked to Wade. Wade reached out and took Stephanie's hand in his. Here it was. They were going to announce they wanted Stephanie to move in and that it was time Katie moved out. The thing is, Katie, Wade stumbled. Well, Stephanie, I...